Hi, I'm Femi OK. You're watching the stream. On today's episode, we're looking at sport from the perspective of the fan. Loving sports when they don't love you back. Modern dilemmas of a sports fan. That's today's topic inspired by this book. The authors are joining us as well. Hello, Jessica. Hello, Kathitha. Really good to see you. Tell the world who you are and what you do. Jessica, you start. Yes, I'm Jessica Luther. I'm a freelance journalist. I live in Austin, Texas. I co-host a feminist sports co podcast called Burn It All Down. And then, of course, I'm the co-author of this book with Kavitha. Kavitha. Hi, I'm Kavitha Davidson. I'm based in New York. Uh, I'm a sports writer and a podcast host. I host the athletics flagship show, The Lead, and uh, very proud to be the co-author of this book as well. Mm -hmm. I love that we have three women talking about sport or sports, as they say in America. Our audience heads may well explode if they're exploding and you're on YouTube. That's OK. Jump into the comment section if you've got questions for Jessica or Kafitha about being a sport fan and some of the big, deep dilemmas that go along with that. Jump into the YouTube comments and you two can be part of the conversation. Let's talk about these modern dilemmas. What as a, as a sport fan or fan of sports, what that actually means. Why did you get together to write the book, Jessica and Kafitha? Well, I think especially as women in this space, we're constantly made to feel like we don't belong as sports fans, let alone as sports writers and journalists. And, you know, I think that a lot of the frustrations that arise from that, from being kind of labeled as the unicorn in the room is how I put it, um, really led to, you know, to us wanting to write this book and to do a deeper examination of some of those dilemmas and, and still why we continue coming back to sports, why we love them so much, even when they might not always return the favor. Mm, Jessica? Yeah, I mean, Kavitha really hit it. I think the book is structured, it's 14 chapters, I think we ended up with. Uh, each chapter is a different theme or an issue within sport that a conscientious sports fan might have. So brain trauma, uh, racism or sexism, LGBTQ athletes, uh, racist mascots, like all kinds of stuff. And these are the things that Kavitha and I as fans ourselves, things that we wrestle with every time that we turn on the TV or go to a match or a game. And we just really wanted a space where we could work that out for ourselves and talk to a bunch of people who also feel that way, who are experts in these fields and, and put all of these different topics in conversation with each other. Such good timing. I want to share with you a headline here. Milwaukee Bucks set off a postponement of NBA playoff games in protest of the shooting of Jacob Blake. So your book came out just around about COVID, just around about some extreme activism from players who up until that point have been told politics and sport, activism and sport. It was a really tricky area. And then COVID happened. And then the Black Lives Matter movement became more prominent around the world. So this moment when there was these wildcat strikes, Kafitha, Jessica, how did you break that down in the book? The book was just about coming out. So how did that reflect what you had written already, what you had already, like your philosophy of the difficulty of being a fan and seeing athletes being activists at the same time? Well, I will say that it's very strange whenever someone says how good timing the book was <laughs> coming out at mm -hmm. this time, because when COVID hit, uh, when Rudy Gobert, an NBA player, tested positive and the entire league shut down, we had a panic moment. Jessica and I had a call with our publisher and we were like, is it going to be relevant? Is it going to be insensitive? People are dying. Like, do they want to hear about the problems that we have within sport? And it turns out because of all of the dilemmas that the pandemic has kind of brought to the forefront. And then obviously the Black Lives Matter movement really going global, as you said. Um, it, it's been very strange and very, um, very surreal to see the book be more relevant than we ever thought it could be. What we try to unpack, we have a chapter in, in, in the book specifically about athlete activism and about why basically sticking to sports isn't an option for a lot of people, particularly for black men and women in America. Um, and, and for athletes finally realizing how much power they have and how much voice they have and, and being able to give, like speak truth to that power and speak truth to, um, to what they've actually, what they have in their hands has been really something to see. Yeah, and so I'll just add that, can I just, just add that like the chapter yeah, about yes. sports and politics is 
a lot about athlete activists because there's a long history of that. And what we saw with the Milwaukee Bucks and the WNBA and all kinds of activism around the world, really, in sport, uh, that, that history is there. But politics and sports are always linked. And it's been very clear here in the United States as we went through a presidential election that I know a lot of people were following. Um, college football and its return to the field was part of a presidential debate, right? That sports often finds itself within politics as much as we see politics within sport. And those two things are always married. I always think about the fact that we call them political races, right? Like even the language that we use within politics has a sports inflection to it because those two things are so similar within so many cultures. So yeah, what Kavitha said, they're like, you can't stick to sports, right? So what we saw with the Wildcat Strikes, it was an extreme version of, of something. And it, Kavitha and I liked it. <laughs> like we're on that side of, I would say the political spectrum, but this is just part of a long history. Tell us a story from the book. I don't need to share all of the book, but just just uh, tease people a little bit of an athlete activist who we may not have heard of before. Hmm. hmm. Like who's in the book? <laughs> We're remembering your book. Um, who do we talk about in the book? I'm How trying to about think. The I mean, Colin Kaepernick who, who turned her back before taking a knee. Oh, popular. Tony. Yes. Thank mm. you. So Tony Thompson, she many years ago now. So we would think it was during the, I guess, first, when was it? It would have been after 9-11. So it was, you know, almost 20 years ago. And she was playing at a very small school um, in basketball, women's college basketball, and had her own sort of political awakening and really started to question whether or not the United States flag and the anthem represented her. She, um, one of her parents is black and she identifies that way. And with all the nationalism after 9-11, she felt really uncomfortable and started to turn her back during the national anthem. And it became a huge story uh, somewhat because the New York Times was right down the road. They, they covered it. She had all this national press and uh, it was, it was the kind of action that we've had a lot of conversation around since Colin Kaepernick, the NFL player, took a knee a few years ago. But we see people like Tony, who was doing it with even a tiny platform, right? Like it was a lot about the principle and what this meant to her and using sport as a place to do that. I'm going to share with our audience a quote from the book because I want you to talk about why there's so much racism in the sport. One of the main reasons that devoted sports fans may not feel welcome is that so much of the coverage is created by a specific subset of our population, namely white men, most of them straight, the vast majority cisgender. In fact, the homogeneity of sports media cannot be overstated. I have heard so many times, he is running like a leopard across the field. Look at the build on that athlete. And, and these are for athletes of color. And I'm wondering if a sports person or sports journalist of color would even use that same vernacular. Kafifa, you start on this one. Jessica, you pick up. Yeah, I, it's, it really does matter who is telling these stories and who is doing the coverage. And I think that's why we do have a chapter about, um, about sports media and diversity in sports media and the need for that. Um, and exactly what you said, because we would not as people of color frame these stories in the same way. And it, it matters to have a lot more voices and a lot more perspectives coming in, especially when the athletes that we cover are people of color and aren't just cisgender white men. Um, it, it also, it, it speaks to a broader problem that we have in media, particularly in the United States, but I think we probably have this, this problem in, in media throughout the world where the people in power look like the people who are telling the stories and the people who are doing the journalism. And what we wanted to do in this chapter in our book was really highlight the fact that there are other people out there doing this work and they need to be heard and they need to be read and we need to support them. Mm. Uh, yeah, Jessica, and I'll one, just... of, one of my favorite parts of the book was mm -hmm. where you just list a whole load of female sports journalists. It was like a sports journalist fiesta. And it was one after another, after another, after another. So if you didn't know that many, you definitely knew a load by the end of that chapter. Jessica, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, and 
that chapter is different than all the other ones in the book. It has a different format. It's much more almost like an oral history. And what we did exactly what you said. There are a lot of female journalists in that chapter. And we asked them to tell us something about their experience within the field. And we really left it open. But we also just asked men of color. We asked um, non-binary or uh, gay sports reporters, people whose voices we don't normally get to hear because it's really hard to overstate how um, white and male sports media is. Like media in general has a diversity issue and sports is what's sort that of like? the what, worst version of it. What, what description would you give of that where you've both been working and you just look around and describe what you see when you're in a work environment? I, I mean, can I just say that oh, last year I went to the Women's World Cup and this is my story. I don't often end up in press boxes, so that's not my experience. I write a lot on the culture of, of sports programs, and so I'm not in press boxes. And I'll never forget last year going to the opener for the Women's World Cup in Paris and walked in and was kind of taken aback about how many men there were. There were definitely women there, but we all kind of congregated together. And mm. what hit me was that they're sending people to cover it who normally cover soccer or football. And so it's normally men, right? And so they've just shifted them over to cover the women for a month of time. Uh, and you feel it. Like there is a physical reaction you have going in there about you recognize your difference as soon as, as, soon as you step in that space. Sophie, I can say, say? Um, having having been in quite a few press boxes myself you are very aware when you were the only woman in that space um you were very aware when you're the only woman of color in particular and i you know i just as a quick story i was covering the nba all-star game at madison square garden in new york um several years ago and you know the way that they have the press seating set up is they have two rows basically in the arena where it's just press and everyone has their headphones on and they're at their computer and they're typing away and they're covering the game and all of that and i noticed the entire press row lift their heads and pay attention to what was happening on the court because the cheerleaders took the court and it's things like that that make you very aware of when you are the only person who looks like you in the room mm -hmm. i want to um segue into uh, hmm, mascots uh kavitha because you you looked a lot at those uh, in 2020 why would there be any mascots of Native American Indians? Any mascots that would make us go, mm -hmm. that's not quite right, Kavitha. It's a very good question why we are still grappling with this. This is something that indigenous people, especially in this country, have been telling us that they are not okay with for 50, 60 years at this point. Um, I think that it has a lot to do with what our identities are and how they are wrapped up into our sports fandom. And that's something that we actually interviewed um, a sports psychologist about, about why it's so difficult for us to separate these um, these issues that we have with, with, with our own fandom. And what she said basically was when your sports fandom is formed, it tends to be earlier in life and it tends to be a part of your own identity formation. So if you are a fan of a team that has a racist native mascot, when someone comes along and criticizes that, you feel like they're criticizing you. They're criticizing th something very core to your identity, even though this is hurtful to people. And honestly, we had we saw the Washington football team change their name and their logo this, this summer, not out of, frankly, any goodness of their heart, but because investors had a problem with it. So what we can do is we can follow the money and we can put actual mm -hmm. monetary and financial pressure on people to ultimately do the right thing. Thing, but it is very frustrating that this is still a conversation we're having. And Jessica will tell you that there are still, even though the Washington football team and the NFL changed their name, there are still 80 some odd high schools that still have that name and still have some kind of a logo that is problematic. And it, it especially here, especially in the United States, it runs deep into our core also of our American identity and the foundation of this country based on that kind of violence. Um, and it really is difficult for people to try and reconcile those things. Ladies, can I play a video comment for you? This is from Elizabeth Holloway. She's a spokesperson for the Exeter Chiefs uh, for Change. And the Exeter Chiefs are a United Kingdom rugby team. And 
just before uh, we take a little bite from her, she explains how when they were trying to talk about this, the way that you've been speaking about it, Kavitha, um, the way that you're t uh, tackling it, Jessica, that the fans got really aggressive and they didn't want to hear about racism at all. Um, and Elizabeth had a little bit more, and here's a question for you. Uh, additionally, uh, the hypocrisy that we're seeing from people like the Premiership, who, who run the competition in England, and the RFU, the Rugby Football Union, who are the regulator for rugby in the UK, they have both launched rugby against racism type initiatives. Yet when we raise the uh, contradiction with them, the extra is allowed to carry on using racist chants, racist logos, racist imagery. They tell us that it's something completely different. It's not racism. It's not related. It's completely different. So that hypocrisy of why people say they're against racism, say they're against causing offence, want to have inclusion and equality, yet don't think that this is a problem. Uh, be really interested in your views on that. Do we just have to be patient and keep trying to educate and share these experiences or is there anything more we can do? Hmm. That's so interesting to me because I'm so happy to have her here on this. The Exeter Chiefs is the example I always use of how this has breached the American borders uh, that you find these images in other parts of the world. And I think, oh man, that's such a good question. It's such a hard one because here in the United States, we've had indigenous and native people for decades, half a century, telling people in power that these mascots are not honoring anyone, that they are in fact bad and they should be changed. And in that same time, we've seen other teams change their logos, change their team mascots. It's a, it's possible. It's not like this is an impossible task. We, we've seen it in action and yet still uh, things don't change. And one thing I'll point out, I, I did some research and, and part of the chapter, we, someone did, a, a psychologist, a sociologist did a study about this. And what they found is not just that, native, that the native mascots make native people feel worse about themselves, which that should be enough alone, but that they actually make white people feel better about themselves. And so you're really up against some big societal forces here in trying to get this changed. And I think what Elizabeth is talking about there, the, the people that love the Exeter Chiefs feel, and it goes back to what Kavitha said too, they feel implicated in that racism when you tell them that there's something wrong with the mascot. And maybe what they need is to really sit with the fact that maybe they are implicated and they gotta really figure that out. I am looking at some questions on YouTube for you ladies. I hope you don't mind digging into them. So uh, DT Paul, DT Paul, thank you for, for watching DT. It, this topic that you're bringing up, or these topics that you're bringing up, these modern dilemmas of sports fans, Fans don't talk about them, Dita Paul says. Talking about the neg negative aspect, there's a little bit of talk, but no one really sees them as negative. Yeah, I think that um, some fans do talk about these things. The, reason, the whole reason that this book came about was because Jessica and I and, and friends like us and people that we work with have these conversations all the time. And one of the things that we really wanted to do with the book was allow, allow the space for these conversations to happen without someone questioning your own fandom, if that makes sense. We, we lead the book basically by saying, we love sports. We love sports so much that we do this for a living, that we cover these things, but we believe that they can be better. We want them to be better because we think that they have the capacity to do so. So in having these conversations, and we don't have all of the answers, we like very decidedly say in the book, we don't have solutions, uh -huh. uh, wholesale <laughs> solutions here because none of these issues are actually black and white, right? And no individual fan is going to fix systemic racism. However, if you're at a bar, whenever we're allowed to go to bars again, and you're watching a game and someone mentions that they might be uncomfortable with a player who is up there because of something they've mm -hmm. been accused of, or that they're uncomfortable about the financial uh, arrangement of the way the game is played, being able to have that conversation without policing someone's fandom, I think is really important.
Oh, Kafifa, this is spooky. It's almost like you're watching the YouTube comments go whizzing by. I'm going to ask for brief, <laughs> brief answers, okay? Brief answers to these. Hamza bin Ali Tara. Thank you, Hamza. Are sports figures given too much importance by society? Jessica, you picked that one up. I've got one more for Kafifa. Oh, I don't know if they're given too much importance. They certainly are given a lot of importance, and I think we just have to start. Like, that's just the starting place. So they're going to be important, and we should be having these conversations around them. Mohamed Kualini Lay says, um, and this picking up on the money, the money uh, uh, mentioned that you just made, Kafifa. Uh, why billionaire clubs don't make more of return to the communities in which those clubs are located? Well, because they don't have to, right? Um, oh, people with a lot easy. of money. Yikes. I mean, that's the easiest answer. People with a lot of money don't give away money for no reason. So unless governments right. or, or official, uh, officials make them do that, they're not going to. All right. Uh, there is, an, and I think sport or sports have always done this. They've, uh, athletes have always connected with what is going on in the rest of the world. Um, this question is from Jennifer McClearian. She's an assistant professor and she has a question for both of you. Uh, here she is. When we talk about women's sports in progressive circles of society, we often focus in on this idea that representation matters. If she can see it, she can be it. My research problematizes this assumption and says that we need to think about other issues that lie below the surface of what we can see in terms of representation. So for example, my forthcoming book looks at women in the UFC, and while they've increased their level of exposure by vast by a vast degree in the past several years, there are issues of labor exploitation, pay inequality, and sexism that lie below the surface that we need to pay more attention to. So my question for Kavitha and Jessica is, what do you wish fans and supporters of women's sports would pay more attention to in terms of equity and social justice? Mm, Jen, bringing the good questions. Uh, I think she hits on something so perfect that one of the issues with women's sports is that we're still just trying to get it on television <laughs> a lot of the time. We're just trying to get sports media to cover it at all. And so I do feel this... Um, I don't want to be the person who's bad mouthing anything going on with women's sports because I don't want to give anyone who's ready to uh, push it aside again a reason to do that. Right. And so we're I mean, I'm glad that Jen is writing her book. I think that that's so great that we're going to have that you know, text to turn to in order to dig into these issues more deeply. And so part of what we need is we need more coverage, better coverage. We need a more expansive sports media around this so that we have a space to ask all these difficult questions, but those don't displace just the general coverage that we get of women's sport. Kafitha. Yeah, I mean, exactly what Jessica said. We need more coverage. We need, we, we just need to normalize the idea that not only do women love sports, but women play sports and that women playing sports is something valuable, is something that is, it's, it's women's access to sport has been deemed by the United Nations as a human right. So there is a reason that we are pushing for this. And in addition to, to better coverage and, and better video archives and better stats being kept, just being able to tell these stories, because again, these are human beings and they matter. I am just looking at your Twitter page, Kafitha. So, uh, Jessica and I may or may not be screaming right now. I think you're screaming. <laughs> Our book was featured as one of the New York Times best books to give this year. Hashtag loving sports. Let me remind you, loving sports when they don't love you back. Dilemmas of the modern fan. We just looked at the very surface of the book. It's a juicy book. If you love sport or sport, there's so much in there. Now that it's done, now that you're talking about it, if you could sum up the experience, Jessica, in a sentence and Kafitha in a sentence, what would that sentence be? Oh my gosh, in a sentence. I just think this has been such a rewarding experience. And one of the best things is meeting other fans who feel this way and feel seen by this book. Mm. And Kafitha. Yeah, rewarding and I think also cathartic. I think it was cathartic to be able to write about these things mm -hmm. and to have people agree and, and receive it in the way that they've been. Thank you. Thank you so much. And also what 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 struck me was that every day there is a new story that you could have put in your book or something new that happened that you could have put in your book. <laughs> but it is so yes. relevant, so juicy. Uh, Jessica and Kapitha, thank you so much. We are going to continue the conversation on Instagram Live, not with Jessica and Kafitha, but with 
friend of the stream, Maxwell Pierce. He's an athlete, he's a humanitarian and an artist. Fan dilemmas from an athlete's perspective. 2030 GMT, that's from Sunday. But for now, I will wrap up and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care.